Hi everyone, welcome to my brand new series, building a REST API completely from scratch, following clean architecture and domain-driven design principles. Let's get started. In this series, we're going to be building a web API completely from scratch, and I'm gonna to try to make the videos more or less self-contained. So in this video, we're not going to be diving too deep. We're gonna be talking a bit about the product that we're going to be building the backend for, what's the idea behind it, and then we'll set up the project following clean architecture, We'll connect some stuff together. We'll start setting up a bit of authentication and each video will dive deeper into understanding the different methodologies. I don't think it's possible to remember everything in a single video. That's why I'll talk about it when we'll be implementing it. So we'll keep going back to the outer picture and then into the specific thing that we're going to be implementing in that video. So what is this? It's basically a dinner hosting platform and it goes by the same concept of Uber, where you take your car and you turn it into a taxi, or Airbnb, where you take your home and you turn it into a hotel. So here you can take your home and turn it into a restaurant. If you're familiar with domain-driven design, you may be looking at this and already starting to look for aggregates, for domain models, how you would structure this, what will the model look like? And if you're not, then you might be thinking to yourself, what the heck is an aggregate? But what I want to do is just for you to look at this and start imagining what what's the data that we have here and how things might look like behind the scenes right so we have here maybe a title a description start and end time we have a array of pictures and some other stuff here i just want you to, to get your mind imagining how you might architect this yourself but we will get into this later on just for now i want you to get the idea of what we're going to be um, reaching in the end Great, so this is the product that we're going to be building. Now, if you've already heard of clean architecture, or you're familiar with clean architecture, then you definitely saw such a diagram or something that looks similar to this. It's sometimes called clean architecture, onion architecture, ports and adapters, hexagonal architecture. And even though they have different names, it's variations of the same core concept where you have your domain in the center of everything, your core logic, your core application, is in the center and infrastructure details like the database or web clients and so on sits on the outside and that's for you to be able to replace it without having to change your core logic of your application. This is specifically Jason Taylor's clean architecture model. You'll see many variations, but the concept, the core concept is the same. So even though this is what you'll usually see, for me, it's easier to imagine it this way. So this is what we're going to be working with throughout the series. But if you look at it one next to the other, you'll see it's the same, right? So in both of them, you have the presentation, the infrastructure, taking a dependency on the application, right? So same over here. And in the core or in the bottom, you have your domain. So if you're curious, then you can pause the video and take a look what, what's inside every layer. But I really don't want you to try to remember what's over here. I want us to develop an intuition and to have a deep understanding of what goes where. So you don't need to remember anything. You'll just know intuitively or you'll have a deep understanding of what needs to sit in which layer. So we're going to use libraries like Mapster, Mediator, Fluent Validation, Bcrypt, Error And we're going to be covering many common concepts and design patterns such as CQRS, repository, unit of work. And of course, the architecture of the project is going to be following clean architecture and domain driven design principles. And we'll be using Visual Studio Code. So many .NET developers aren't familiar with these tools. So I'm sure you'll find some pretty interesting things that I hope you'll be able to add to your toolkit. And of course, we'll use .NET CLI for everything. So we'll be covering some interesting commands. If this seems interesting, then make sure to subscribe and follow along. Hopefully by the end of the series, then you'll have a deep understanding of these technologies and you'll have a good intuition as to how to logically split your applications even if it's completely different. So I do have a couple of disclaimers. First and foremost, this is an educational video. We're going to be covering a lot of topics, mainly so you get to know them and maybe you can use them in your application if it's applicable. But don't take everything that you see as face value and add it to your application. It's probably overkill for many, many scenarios. So that's first of all. Second of all, this is so opinionated. There's so many different approaches 
to many of the stuff that I'm going to show. So this is just what I decided to go with in the end. If you have maybe a different approach or you just want to comment and let me know what you think and how you, maybe you would have done it, then please drop a comment. This isn't for complete beginners. So if you don't know REST, you don't know what a web API is, or if you just feel like it's going way, way, way too fast, then this might not be for you and I apologize. And that's it. My opinions keep changing all the time. So please feel free to educate me as well. This is a series that I've been wanting to do for a really long time. I would have loved to have a video like this when I started learning these topics. And if you aren't already following me on LinkedIn and on Twitter, so I create a lot of nerdy visual infographics that you might enjoy. So take a look if you're into those kind of stuff. If you really want to understand clean architecture, domain-driven design, and how to use all these libraries that we're going to be covering, then I highly, highly recommend you follow along. It's not enough to just watch the videos. So if you haven't already, go ahead and download Visual Studio Code and the .NET SDK, and let's get started. So what are we going to be doing today? Today, we're going to be creating the solution, setting up the projects, the dependencies between the projects, and we'll start doing some authentication work that will continue in the next video. We'll also get to know Visual Studio Code and the development environment that we're going to be working with. So the first thing we want to do is create the solution. So new SLN, and let's give it the name Boober Dinner. This created the folder Boober Dinner, which inside has the Boober Dinner solution. Now let's go ahead and create the project. So the first one we're going to be creating is the booberdinner.api project. So I hope this isn't too small to see, but the presentation layer has two projects inside. One of them is going to be the web API, which will be listening for requests. And the other one is going to be the contracts, which will model our API. So let's go ahead and create the web API project. So .NET new web API, and let's give it the name booberdinner.api. Next, let's create the contracts. As we said, this will model our um, API. So let's call this contracts. Now out, I'll zoom in here. Out of all the five projects that we have, this is the only one that's actually a web API and that will be listening for requests. All the other ones are just class libraries. Okay, next, let's create the infrastructure project. So infrastructure. application. And lastly, the domain. So let's see what we have. So we have our five projects and the solution. Now, let's build it and see what happens. And we see that we get unable to find a project to restore, which seems odd, right? Because we just created five projects. But if you haven't worked with the .NET CLI, then you wouldn't be familiar with this, where if we look at the solution file, so we can see it's still empty. We need to actually add the projects to the solution. So let's do that, .NET SLN add. And we here we want to say all the various CS projects, so we can get it recursively like this. Great, so now let's build it, .NET build. And it built successfully. Now let's create the dependencies between the projects. So we have the API project. The API, the API project needs to know about, sorry, needs to know about the contracts project and about the application project. So let's go ahead and do that. So .NET add first, we say which project, and we want to add a reference to the contracts and the application layer. Perfect. Next, we want the infrastructure to have a dependency on the application. Great. And the application have a dependency on the domain. So now that we have that set up, you might be asking yourself, how is this possible, right? So if the only project that's a web API is the booberdinner.api, then how will we be able to 
use the infrastructure project if it's not reachable. So if we look at it like a tree, then the infrastructure layer is unreachable, right? So if we look at the dependencies, we can't reach the infrastructure layer. And the truth is that theoretically, the infrastructure layer is independent from the presentation layer. But in actuality, we do need a project reference between the API layer and the infrastructure layer because we want the infrastructure layer to be able to register its own dependencies. So we'll look into that um, later as we go on. So for now, let's add the, dependent, the, the infrastructure as a dependency to the API project. I meant to do it the other way around. All right. API and infrastructure. So now that we have everything set up, let's open this in Visual Studio Code. So let's take a look at what we have. We have our solution with reference to the five projects that we created. We have the API project, which is the only one that is using the web SDK. We're using .NET 6. And we have here a reference to the three projects where the domain is accessible via the application. So the API has reference to all the projects, essentially. Let's look what else we got here. So we have the application layer, which should have a dependency only on the domain. We have the contracts, which doesn't have a dependency on anyone. Same goes for the domain. And the infrastructure has a dependency only on the application. So let's go ahead and build our solution. Great, and it built successfully. So the next thing I want to do is um, show you a, the tool that we'll be using to make the HTTP requests throughout the series. So if you go to the extensions and you look for REST client, and you'll find this extension, which has two, 2 million downloads and a higher rating than four seasons, so it's pretty impressive. And this is what we're going to be using to make the requests. You can take a look at their documentation, which is great, but we'll also take a look now at some uh, of the basic features. So we created the web API from the template. So what we get with the template is a single controller, the weather forecast controller, which is available under the host slash weather forecast, all right, because of this trick over here. And, um, what it returns is five random forecasts. So let's make a request to the, to the endpoint and see that it works as we would expect. So .NET run, and we need to specify the project. So the project that we want to run is the API project. And now let's go ahead and make a request using the REST client extension. So let's create a new folder. Let's call it requests. Requests inside here. Create a folder weather and the file get forecast. A plural forecasts, right? Not CS, I meant HTTP. Okay, and the way this works is you basically just write the URL that you want to query. And you can see right away, it pops out this send request option. Let's take the route to the endpoint. So that will be the host, which is over here slash weather forecast. Let's copy this, paste it over here, and click send request. I mapped it to shift enter, so I just click shift enter, and we get five random uh, forecasts. Let's do it again. We see that it's random. Great. So now that we have everything set up, what I want to do is get rid of everything that isn't necessary for us to start. I want to have the minimum code as possible. So let's get rid of this weather forecast model, this controller, and in the program CS, let's get rid of all of this, all of this, and this. And if this looks weird to you when you're used to seeing a program CS and a startup CS, so this is the new web API template starting from .NET 6, where you basically have a single file where you can define everything. So over here you have the builder.services or the builder in general, which you can use it to for configurations and the dependency injection. And over here you have your regular um, request pipeline configurations. 
So a nice trick that I saw is just creating a scope and putting it inside. I like it, it just seems more organized. Okay, the next thing we want to do is over here, get rid of this, we won't be needing that. And let's fix this, put this underneath. I think it was also in the infrastructure layer, all right? Let's fix this and let's get rid of all these empty classes. Perfect. Let's build a project, see that it still works. So .NET build. Perfect, everything seems good. I'll go back to the diagram and I want to look at what we'll be creating. So we basically have the register endpoint and the login endpoint. So here's the how the request will look. So you basically have the first name, the last name, a unique email and the password. And then the response, you get everything back other than the password, including an ID and a token. And for logging in, you only need the email and the password and your response looks actually exactly the same, right? So this and this uh, are modeled in the same way. So these are our two endpoints and the requests, as you would expect, right? So they arrive at the authentication controller. They'll be, they'll be using either the login or the register request model. The request will then go to the authentication service, which is sitting in the application layer. Over here at the moment, we're just going to return a mocked response. So just a hard, hard coded values, which will go back to the controller. And this will go back to the client like that. So what's the rationale behind splitting the code logically between the presentation and the application layer? So we want the presentation layer to be the door to the outside world. So currently we're using rest, but we'd want to have the option when we're modding, modeling it to replace this with GraphQL or gRPC or some other technology that will come up in the future. So the idea here is that this is a gateway to the outer world. We want to take the data that's coming in, take it from that form and transform it to the language that our core logic of the application knows to speak. And that's the, that's the language that's in the domain layer and the application layer, which has our use cases. So in this case, one of our use cases in our application is the user being able to log in and the user being able to register. So that's why it sits in the application layer. So I just want to note that in the final result, we're going to be using CQRS and Mediator, and this won't look like this, but just for the moment, this is what we're going to be using. So let's go ahead and implement it. So the first thing I want to do actually is to create here a new folder. I'll call it docs. Inside here, let's just call this api.markdown and I'll paste in the API definition. So let's paste it in here. So this is the API definition that we looked at before, visualized. Let's open it in this markdown preview uh, extension. It's called markdown preview enhanced. You can use it, it's great. And this is just so we have it when we're modeling our request. Let's go to our contract. And over here, let's create a new folder, authentication, authentication, looks right. Over here, let's create the register request and the login request. And let's also create our um, authentication response, right? Because we said it's the same model for both of them. So authentication response. Great, go ahead and model it. So we have our register request, register request, which has a first name, a last name, an email, thank you, GitHub Copilot, and a password. Perfect. And for the login, it will be exactly the same. So I'll copy the namespace. but it'll be only the email and the password. And this will be login. And for the response, so as we said, it's going to look similar to this. Let's copy everything here. Only it's going to be authentication response. 
it's not going to have the password. This instead will be the token. And over here, we're going to have the ID that was generated, right? So this models this thing over here. Great. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and create our controller. So we're in the API controllers. Let's create a new authentication controller. A public class authentication controller. This will inherit from the controller base. Let's give it the API controller attribute, which does the magic behind the thing. We will get into it maybe in the future. If not, then I'll create a video about it in the future. But this does a couple of things behind the scenes. And let's step the route, right? So I could do controller, but this would match authentication. And over here, I think I wrote, yeah, I wrote auth. So let's just write auth like that. And we want two endpoints, right? The register and the login. So let's go ahead and do that. So route register, amazing. And return action result, call it register. Yes, that's what I wanted. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. And login, I can write it. Perfect. And this won't be the register request, it'll be the login request. And that seems about right. Let's return the request from here and from here as well. So let's run the project and see that it's working as we expect. So let's run the API. And I just noticed that I wrote here a route and I meant to write HTTP post. So let's run the project, see that everything is wired together as we expect it to be. Over here, let's delete the weather. Instead, let's create an authentication folder, which will have register and login. Over here, let's copy the URL. And instead of host, let's put our actual host, which is over here. And we need our body. So if we try to make a request, then this will fail. And that's because we haven't defined anywhere that we're sending JSON. So let's do that. Content type, content type, application JSON make the request and we get the response as we expect. And something that you can do with the REST client plugin is create variables. So we can say, okay, I have the host variable, which is this. Now I can replace this with host, All right? So now it matches the definition of the API. We can just copy and paste this and it should work. And if you want to add multiple requests in the same file, so simply put three hashtags, and then you can define another request here. So if we have another request, then uh, we can send it as well. And this is also common, so you can add your uh, title if you prefer. But for me, I find it easier to just separate it to different files. That way I can search for the request that I want to make and then uh, call it. So this is for a register. Let's copy it to the login, which will be the same only login and it will need only the email and the password and we get this back great so in the future we'll see how we can take these variables and define them as environment variables and that way we don't need to have them defined in each of the files right so we'd have for example the token we'll set the token value and then it'll work throughout all of our requests but the usage will still be the same with the same syntax. OK, so let's go back to our controller. And over here, what we want to do is send it to the authentication service in the application layer. So let's close some stuff here, go to the application layer, create services inside authentication. And here we'll have the authentication service.cs. Let's have this interface. 
and let's copy and paste this and tap implementation as well. Authentication. Yes, that's what I want. But as we said before, we don't want the definition of our API to leak into the application layer because then it's harder to version it in the future and change the, the schema of the requests. So we don't want to have anything from the contract project in the application layer. Now, luckily, we can't because the application layer doesn't reference uh, up towards the API or the contracts. So even if we wanted to, we can. So this is just an example of how separating the projects like this and defining the dependencies, it stops us from doing something that might not be aligned with what we want to do logically. So instead, let's have this receive. For, for now, let's have it just get the values, right? So we have the first name, first name, the last name, the email and the password. Perfect. And for the response, so the response for both of them, both of the uh, methods will be the same, right? So we said this receives only the email and the password, but the response from the service will be the same. So let's just create an object for the response. Let's call it authentication result. And this will consist of um, exactly this, yes, right? Let's see that I'm not missing anything. Right, so we have the ID, the first name, the last name, the email that's open, right? So let's have this as a response. Now, don't worry, we're going to be refactoring this multiple times in the upcoming videos. So for now, uh, just bear with me. This will be res result, right? Both here and here. And let's implement this. So namespace, public class authentication service, which implements the I authentication service. And let's, let's implement the two methods. For now, let's just return a new authentication result. Let's have it see what it's, what it's offering. Yeah. Why not, right? So it's generating a new GUID. And for the token, just hard codes token. Let's wrap this. And let's do the same over here. Just that here, we don't have the first name and the last name. So let's just have it for now. Hard code of strings. Obviously, in the next videos, we'll replace this with the actual implementation. Um, great. So now that we have this defined in the application layer, we can go back to the controller and use it. So private i application service. Yes, that thing. Authentication service. Let's inject it to the constructor. Then we can call it from here. So let's say var auth result equals, and let's call the authentication service register. And let's pass it all the details. So not just this request dot first name. Make sure that it's what we want email and password. Yes, it seems right. Let's wrap the argument and see what it wants. So it doesn't have an overload, it takes four arguments, and that's because, yeah, I messed up the names here, so this should be registered, this should be login. And now that we have a result, then we can map the values to the API response, which is the authentication response. So let's create that. Response. New authentication response. Yes, that. And here we can just have it auth result dot ID, right? It's the GUID, the first name, the last name, the email, and the token. Perfect. And let's have it return the response. And for the login, it's going to be more or less the same. So let's go ahead and copy all of this. 
paste it over here. Instead of calling register, let's call login and get rid of this. Map it exactly the same and return our response. Right, so let's try calling our backend and see if it works. Oh, I updated the names in the interface, but I didn't update it in the implementation. So let's replace these two. All right, so this is login, and this one is register. And let's try again. Great, so it's running. And now I'm going to make the request, and some of you might already be saying this ain't going to work. And if that's what you're thinking, then you are right. And that's because we implemented the interface, but we didn't define anywhere how to inject it, right? Because the controller is requesting the interface. And that's the exception that we're getting. So let's go to our program CS, add the, the dependency. So let's add it as it's scoped. We want the authentication service to be the authentication service. Perfect. So now that we have this wired up, let's run the product again. Go to the register request, make a request. And as we expect, it works. So here we have a random GUI and we have the hard-coded token. Let's check the login request. And same goes for the login, only that here we have these two strings hard-coded as well. So now that we have all of this stuff set up, there's one other thing that I want to talk about in this video. So in our clean architecture structured solution, we want each layer to be in charge of its own dependencies. So what we did until now is we registered the authentication service over here in the program CS, but it's actually defined in the application layer. And it would be nice if we can just say to the application layer, listen, I want you to register all of your dependencies and same goes for the infrastructure layer. And then if you have separate teams, for example, then each team knows where to look for its dependencies. So in many teams, when the project becomes big, you might have an entire team that works only on the infrastructure layer. For example, I know in Microsoft, it's like that in many teams. So let's go ahead and do that. So we want to create a new file, just close everything in the application layer. Let's call it dependency injection. What we're going to have here is a single static extension method that registers everything that's um, for the application layer. So public static um, class depend into injection. Let's have this a public static. And here we want this service collection add application. Right? And this will be I service collection services. And over here, we'll do all our registrations. Now, we could try to add it, but it's not recognized. And that's because this is just a class library. If you're like me, and you don't remember what symbol belongs to which NuGet package, then there's another Visual Studio extension, which I like, which is called reverse, uh, something NuGet reverse. Yes, this thing, NuGet reverse package search. Basically, what it allows you to do is select a symbol, and then reverse search and it'll tell you which package it belongs to. So let's try doing that. Control shift P, reverse package search. And here it is. So this is the uh, package that we want to use. So let's go ahead and add this. So .NET add to the application layer, the package Microsoft that extensions dependency injection abstractions. Great, now we can add it. And let's move the definition from the program CS to here. Let's include this. We can now get rid of this using statement over there. And 
we need to return the services. Now we just need to call it from over here. So let's say builder dot add application services dot add application. So we're calling it from here. Let's do the same thing for the infrastructure layer. So let's just actually copy this file, paste it over here in the infrastructure layer. And we want to change some stuff here. Let's update this to infrastructure. Let's get rid of this and this. And of course, we want to call this add infrastructure. Infrastructure. Let's call this from the program CS as well. So add application and add infrastructure. Let's make a request and see that this still works. So .NET build. Nice. Let's run it. So we have our register re request. Seems to work. Let's log in. And it works as well. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for joining me. I had a great time making this. This is actually my first ever YouTube video. So I'm very eager to hear what you thought about it. So please let me know in the comments. That's my best way to improve. Last thing before we finish, I want to show you a sneak peek of what's coming up in the next video. So what we currently have, and let me zoom in, is we have the authentication controller, which makes a call to the application layer. Right now, for us, it's the authentication service. This is part of the final result diagram. And what we're going to be doing in the next video is implementing a JWT token generator, which from the point of view of the application layer, it's just making a call using the interface. So it's going to return a response. And it's going to go back to the user. But the actual implementation is sitting over here in the infrastructure layer. So we're going to be creating both a JWT token generator and a password hasher. This is a good example of separation of concerns between the layers. So that's why I wanted to add authentication to the service, even though probably in companies like Uber and probably in your company as well, you have some identity server, which will be in charge of this stuff. But it's a good way to look at how to separate your logic between the different layers. I'm really enjoying making this series, and it's taking me much more time than I would have thought it would take. So if you're liking this and you want to support my channel, make sure to subscribe, hit a like, and my source code will be available for my Patreons. But if you don't want to, don't worry. You can still follow along using only the videos. I want to thank Milan and Paul for taking the time to sit with me and go over the architecture. Gave me some great insights. So thank you for taking the time. And see you in the next one.